Lee Tolan, I uh, became associated with these characters for the, well, actually, let me, started out in grade school and junior high school as a, an amateur magician and ventriloquist, and back then, every book you found at the school library or uh, the public library on stage magic and illusion were by Walter Gibson. And they always sat in the end papers, so he was the creator of the famous Shadow novels. So when they started reprinting uh, the Shadow, well, actually, new Shadow novels, I, I found them out. Uh, and I was actually in junior high. Uh, I think by ninth grade, I had uh, six Shadow Pulp magazines in the 30s in my collection. Uh, I was someone who was determined to find a way to p get people to pay me to do what I love doing. Uh, something I recommend highly when I speak to school groups, I, you know, I always say, I mean, you know, making a hell of a lot of money in a field you hate and having to, you know, spend a lot of it on psychiatrists because you hate your day-to-day -day life. It's not a way to go through life. And uh, when I was 21, I moved to New York City. Uh, determined to get into comic books, I saved up $1,000 and was expecting to starve. And two and a half weeks later, I was hired as assistant editor of Creepy Eerie Vampirella and Famous Monsters of Filmland. What year was that? Uh, 73. I worked on Famous Monsters 100 and Vampirella 23. And then I went and worked in the Marvel bullpen for a little while and then went back to college. And uh, then moved back to New York and got a job at DC Comics, originally as head proofreader. And, uh, and after two years, then briefly as a staff artist, and then for uh, five and a half years as assistant production manager in charge of all color work at the company. And uh, suddenly I was like a 22-year-old, you know, fanboy sitting in the Warner cafeteria having lunch with my childhood idols, people like Murphy Anderson and Fritz <coughs> Wan and Joe Hubert and Sergio Aragones, the mad cartoonist. And I was sitting there having lunch with them because I was one of the guys they worked with at the office. And at that time, uh, <clears throat> DC Comics had, by my count, uh, 32 staff employees, including the payroll department upstairs. So there were about <clears throat> 20 of us in editorial and production, and you know it was a very small, you know, family where everybody mattered. And uh, my uh, wife, Adrian, who I met at the first Famous Monsters of Filmland convention, watching Dracula: Prince of Darkness, uh, became the uh, color artist on a lot of DC's top comics, colored over 600 Batman comics, uh, uh, meaning uh, 192 issues of uh, Batman, uh, 202 issues of Detective Comics, Robin, Shadow of the Bat, Brave and the Bold, the Batman, she did. also the Wolfman Press, Teen Titans. But anyway, suddenly I was in New York and I was working with a lot of the people, well, you know, most of the pulp publishers went into comic books when comic books came in. And, uh, uh, Mark Goodman, the publisher of the Red Circle pulp line, became Marvel Comics. Timely in the Marvel Comics. Uh, the uh, Harry Dunnenfeld, publisher of the, the Trojan and Culture pulp lines and the Spicy Pulps, but also things like Parisian Nights and Pep with 16 pages of art study photographs <laughs> art of study. new women. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and as, as some of you may have heard, uh, basically something appeared in one of the art study photographs that shouldn't have and, uh, uh, for the time. And uh, a man named, I believe, Herbie Siegel took the rap for him and went to prison for four months for Donenfeld and had a job at DC for life. But Donenfeld uh, decided he should go into something where you couldn't do prison time. And, uh, uh, he was, by the way, quite interesting. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Jerry Jones, who wrote The Shadow Strikes for DC and co-wrote the Doc Savage uh, Shadow Crossovers. He wrote a wonderful book, the best history of comics ever written, uh, to my mind, and it's called uh, Men of Tomorrow, Geeks, Gangsters, and the Birth of the Comic Book. And among other things, he links Harry Donenfeld with both uh, Frank Costello, the mobster, and Margaret Sanger, the birth control pioneer. And basically, as a disreputable printer, he was willing to print her birth control treatises, which at a time when such things were illegal, and sell her birth control devices under the table through his Eastern news distribution outlets. 
and at the same time he was smuggling into the country uh, bootleg liquor from Canada with his Canadian papers that was for Frank Costello's speakeasy. So it's a fascinating story of comics. Uh, uh, for many years, DC Comics was a family company in more ways than one. Uh, but anyway, suddenly I was working with Julie Schwartz, who'd been a science fiction writer's agent for you know, Alfred Bester and Henry Kuttner and Edmund Hamilton, who was the agent of Captain Future. He sold uh, Love, got Lovecraft his biggest check ever. You know, and uh, Robert Block, you know, he sold Ray Bradbury's first 72 stories. <coughs> so, you know, this was just living history. And Saul Harrison and Jack Adler, who were my immediate bosses at DC Comics, had both worked on Action Comics number one, doing color separations. Saul Harrison had operated the stapling binding machine on the first comic book ever published, Famous Funnies number one in 1934. So. I was just living, you know, I was learning and being taught by these people who had been in the business um, from the very beginning and from the days when it was a pulp publisher, too. And uh, I was living in Midtown Manhattan, um, had a studio apartment at 53rd and 2nd, 200 a month. Uh, for a while in 1975, a, f a friend of mine and I had, uh, sorry, 74. A friend of mine and I shared the penthouse of the Hotel Consulate at 49th and Broadway. Uh, 350 a month utilities paid. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, when you're living in Manhattan, you're living in the center of the universe and uh, the capital of the world, really. cultural capital, the financial capital, the business capital. But uh, the, the Murder Inc. bookstore started having a monthly series of symposiums. Uh, with mystery writers, and one month they had Walter Gibson and John Nanovich, the editor of the Shadow Magazine. You know, it was three dollars or five dollars admission or something. And I went with some of my friends, and afterwards I went up to Walter to ask him to sign my uh, hardcover, 1934 hardcover of *The Living Shadow*, the first Shadow novel. And he did, and we got talking. And I had some of my friends there were just kind of aghast that I had the effrontery to just go up and try and start a conversation with Walter, the creator of The Shadow. And uh, we're even more amazed when within five minutes Walter invited me to come up and spend a weekend at his house mm -hmm. and his wife. And, uh, uh, but anyway, I mean, it was just, um, I went to my first pulp convention in 1975. Uh, I'd been going to world science fiction conventions. Uh, completed my Shadow Pulp collection in 1978. And uh, Walter Gibson asked me to assist him uh, as contributing editor of the Shadow Scrapbook for Harcourt. And most of the, because Walter's pulps were bound, most of the pulps and images from the pulps in that book are mine and the radio. I wrote the sections on radio and film and comic books and, and such. Uh, and it kind of put me on the map with pulp fandom that I was a person Walter Gibson selected. And there were, uh, there were reasons going beyond my talents or, or abilities. I mean, uh, you know, I lived in Manhattan about four blocks from uh, Parker Brace Jovanovich, which was publishing the books from their offices. So, I mean, it was convenient, you know, and, and I was a good contact in the city. But Walter became like my surrogate grandfather. And, uh, you know, just wonderful stories of the Pulps. And, of course, he was also Houdini's um, ghostwriter and biographer. And, the ghostwriter and biographer for Dunninger and Thurston and uh, Mark Wilson and Black Harry Blackstone, and it was just just wonderful. And uh, for those of you who were are comic book fans or were comic book fans, uh, I was of the first. For for many years, there had been no new talent coming into comics. You know, it's virtually impossible to find seventy-year-old comic book professionals. There are very few. Uh, Jim Steranko, Daniel O'Neill, Roy Thomas, uh, Neil Adams, you know, most of which had done newspapering or uh, commercial art before they got into comic books. You can find 60-year-old comic professionals, some 65-year-olds, you can find 80 and 90-year-old comic professionals. But there was a period of about 25 years with no new talent coming in. And then starting around 1968-69, there was, you know, as people started dying off, suddenly there was a need for new talent. And uh, Saul Harrison developed a, a thing at DC Comics called the Woodchuck Pro, a junior bullpen, but 
It ended up being called the Junior Woodshots. We named ourselves after the industrious uh, uh, nephews of uh, Donald Duck and Uncle Scrooge. Uh, Mark Emanier at Gold Key threatened that if they ever had a new talent program or at Western Publishing, they were going to name it the Justice League of America. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and I ended up uh, meeting people, uh, got to do uh, Walter Baumhoff for the original Docs. I have a cover artist, fairly good at Paul Collins, and Ryerson Johnson, who of course ghosted three of the Doc Savage novels and some of the kind uh, of detectives and, and such. And people like uh, Alfred Bester, you know, these people would come up to visit Julie Schwartz. And, uh, I ended up interviewing Alfie, who had written 40 shadow radio scripts for the uh, Shadow Scrapbook. And he insisted when I left that I take all of his original shadow radio scripts and find them, which he said, uh, you know, hey, you're doing this research, I don't need these anymore, just, you know, just take it. And uh, I ended up, uh, I met Jerome Rosen, who was a cover artist on the first cover artist after the two reprint covers uh, to do The Shadow. And he gave it up after four covers and it was his identical twin brother, George Rosen. George Jerome Rosen and Jerome George Rosen. And uh, I commissioned a Doc Savage recreation, I'm not sorry, a Shadow cover recreation, uh, first of many from Jerome, of uh, The Shadow's Justice with The Shadow to holding the scales of justice. And, uh, so the, the day I came to pick it up, it was the third time I had dinner at Jerome's house. And we're, we're just eating over dinner in the kitchen table. And uh, Jerome said, gee, Tony, you know, there's something up in the attic you'd probably like to have. And he said, I couldn't bear to throw it away when, when George died. And, you know, I don't think the housekeeper's throwing it away. If, if you want it, it's yours. I'd be glad to give it to you, you know, just to make sure it has a good home. And I said, what? And he said, the hat. And I said, the black slouch hat that the models wore when posing for 200 of the shadow pole cover. He said, yeah. He said, I'm sure it's still up there. I went up, and there it was hanging from a peg. It looked a lot more like the hat from the shadow pole magazine covers for many years. Uh, and then a couple years ago, after I moved to San Antonio, I had a specialist uh, you know, um, clean it and do a little bit of minor repair work. And uh, uh, to do it, they had to. For, they had to clean it and block it first, and so it looks a little bit less floppy than, than it did, but it used to look exactly. But this is the actual hat. I, I consider this the shadow's real hat. And I say that my house is where the shadow hangs his hat, so actually it's in a hat box. I own Brett Morrison's cape from the shadow radio show. Uh, I uh, have a complete set of the shadow pulp magazine. 